Okay, so next up on our broad review, we have momentum. Momentum. Key equations that we really need here. This one's kind of light on equations overall. The main ones that you fundamentally need, of course, are momentum itself equals our mass times our velocity of our object. That will get you its momentum, at least for massive objects that we're dealing with. Once we get to light and a few other things, you'll find that there are other equations for momentum. But the important one for this section in mechanics is going to be this. The other one that we had, and when we covered it in class, I used a capital I with a vector sign. Uh, it turns out that the standard is apparently a J. This is impulse, one of the reasons why I use the I, but I shows up a bunch of other times as moment of inertia for rotational mechanics, and even more importantly, it shows up as current in electricity and magnetism, so it helps if we have something a little bit different. So we're going to go with a J. But it's impulse, for those of you who were in my class this year, you may have it in your notes as a capital I with the vector sign. It is equal to, at least for the non-calc-based physics, We've got our force, our average force to be precise, times however long that force is applied onto it. Now this is an important concept because it allows you to deal with forces being applied over time and how they affect your momentum. In fact, we'll find that the impulse is also equal to our change in momentum. Okay? These here represent pretty much all the equations you really need for momentum. When it comes to equations, this is, this is it. This is one of those concepts that doesn't have a lot of stuff that you have to keep track of. But it's much harder to keep track of all the particulars on when you can apply it, when you can, and how to use it. So that's what we'll talk about now. Alright, so the absolute most important thing that I have to mention just right off the bat is, and I cannot stress this enough, this is a vector. You'll see I put the vector signs on it here, vector for momentum, vector for velocity, they end up pointing the same way. Our impulse is also a vector, it points in the same direction as our forces, and it's also the direction of our change, our net change in momentum. This is a vector quantity, and as a result, you must, must, must treat this as a vector. And that sounds like over the top obvious, but again, I will direct you to the one question that I ask time and time again, and everybody, well, not everybody, but a significant number of people get wrong. If I take this ball and I throw it at the wall at 3 meters per second, it hits the wall and it bounces back off at 3 meters per second, is its momentum conserved? Did, it, did its it momentum change any? Many, many people will look at it and they'll say, well, its mass didn't change, and it had 3 meters per second before the collision, it had 3 meters per second after the collision, so no, it doesn't change. Wrong. A thousand times wrong. Do not, do not, do not forget that this is a vector, because that is the number one way that you start missing questions related to momentum. In this case, my vector is pointed into the board, and when it bounces off, my vector is pointed out of the board. My momentum is not conserved in that case, at least not with respect to the ball itself. You could set up a system where it's conserved for the whole planet, but that's something where the numbers would become unpleasant, and you don't want to do it that way. From the way that I've set it up, I'm getting across the idea that I really want you to pay attention to. This is a vector quantity, and you absolutely must keep track of the direction on that. Okay? That is the most fundamental thing that I see that most people mess up, and it ends up throwing them off on momentum. So keep that in mind. Okay? Now the next important thing to talk about is something that I kind of drilled into your head, and it's when you can apply conservation of momentum. And the simple answer on that is... When there are, hopefully you know what I'm going to say, when there are no significant external forces. If we don't have any forces that are happening from outside of our system, let's say, for instance, and this is one of those important things to keep track of, I have a system of two tennis balls that are running into each other. There are plenty of significant forces that are happening between these two tennis balls, but as long as there are no external forces, no forces from outside where they're hitting a wall or I'm pushing them while they're colliding or anything like that, then, then as long as there are no significant external forces, their momentum, their combined momentum, must be conserved. 
All right? This is your one-stop question that you can ask if you can apply conservation of momentum or not. If there are no significant external forces, then your momentum must be conserved. And as a reminder to the last video, when we talked about conservation, that leads me to my way of describing it. Conservation means what you start with, you end with. So you'll go through and you'll set this up exactly the same way. You're going to find your initial momentum, keeping track of this guy being a vector, and you're going to set that equal to your final, also being a vector. Can't stress that enough. Now, you may find that you're going to have two particles, so you're going to find the initial momentum of the first particle. You're going to add that to the initial momentum of the second particle. And add that to, you can have a thousand different particles. It doesn't matter how many you have. You just add up all of their individual momenta, and that gives you your total momentum that you start with. But make certain you, you keep track of those vectors. If one's moving to the right and the other's moving to the left, one of those has got to be negative. Okay? Remember those vectors. In the end, you set it equal to however many objects you have. You're going to have some that stick together in a perfectly inelastic collision, where you may have two objects starting off and you've only got one object at the end. And that's all you have to keep track of. Or you may have them bounce off of one another or break into multiple pieces. It doesn't matter. You just find all the pieces that you have at the beginning, you add up their momenta as a vector, you do the same thing at the end with however many pieces you have, and if there are no significant external forces, these two things absolutely, absolutely have to be equal to the same thing. Okay? Can't emphasize that enough, this is the key to solving all momentum-based problems. If you can keep this down, handful of simple rules, you can solve anything when it comes to momentum. Now the final things, and I've kind of alluded to them quickly here, I'm going to remind you of the terminology. We have elastic collisions. These are ones where our kinetic energy is also conserved. Now these don't happen much in, in the real world. But we have collisions that often are very close to that, that we can assume them to be that. Okay, so when we have elastic, that means our kinetic energy is conserved. If we have them collide and they don't stick together, and their kinetic energy is not conserved, not conserved. This is actually most of the collisions that you'll actually deal with. They're one form of inelastic or another. Your momentum is still conserved, so long as there are no significant external forces, but your kinetic energy is not always conserved. Where does that energy go? Well, it goes into sound, it goes into heat, sometimes you deform the, uh, maybe it's a clay ball and it hits something and it deforms. That requires energy. And so that's where that kinetic energy goes. And then finally, and this is another one that is very common, perfectly inelastic. This is when they stick together. This is when, like this example up here, you have two objects that you start with, they stick together and become one object in the end. That is a perfectly inelastic collision. Now a couple things that I want to point out on this, an important thing to remember about perfectly inelastic is your kinetic energy is not conserved. It is never, can never be conserved in, an, in a perfectly inelastic collision. You see two things stick together, their kinetic energy cannot be conserved. Okay? We could go through a proof of that at some point, but it's not a bad thing to just be familiar with. When they stick together, you lose some kinetic energy in there. For the most part, it goes into the deformation of the two things sticking together. Parts of them kind of crumble up. Okay? The other thing to keep in mind on this, because we saw one like this, it isn't always two things flying together and sticking together. We found that you can actually have the exact same thing, except in reverse. Now the sample problem I gave you guys, and you all had to solve, was a firework. Where the firework came up here, got up to some height, it started off as one object with a, an initial momentum, and I had it explode into three pieces. One that went off this way, one that went off this way, and then a final one that I think would have to go off this way. Okay? So, the other thing about the perfectly inelastic is it's not always several things flying towards each other and sticking together. We can do it in reverse. We can have one thing that explodes. When you encounter that, still, as long as there are no significant external forces, again, that is your one-stop shop. No significant external forces. Everything that's happening in this firecracker is inside. That means that your momentum has to be conserved. The final thing that I'll mention, even though you don't see it very often, is since this is a vector, we have to conserve momentum 
in the x direction and in the y direction independently. In other words, when I drew this out, I have this guy, it came up here and it kind of stopped here. Uh, I think in the sample problem I had, it was at the apex, so it got up to the very top. It had no momentum initially, because it was right at the point where our velocity was zero, and then it exploded. I have one piece going off this way, one piece that's going up to the right, so this one has to, since both of these are going to the right, and we started off with no momentum in the x direction. This guy has to be going off, I should have drawn the vector much longer, actually. He's got to be going off way off to the left, so that when I add the component here, to the x components of these guys, we end up with the zero that we started with. I also need the y component here to cancel out the y component of this guy so that my momentum in the y direction is also adding up to zero. Got to conserve them independently. What you start with in the x is what you end with in the x. What you start with in the y is what you end with in the y. These are the keys to dealing with momentum problems.